Let's take a look inside this phone, to have it in parts or to discuss it in detail? That is the question. Hi, nice to see you on this channel. Do you like to look inside different devices? I really enjoy it. So let's deal with Nasisus 270 phone today. This device hosted previously on my channel when I prepared a short reportage about its repair. The video aroused great interest. Do you agree with me that it is worth presenting a little more its operation principles and possibilities? Do you know, for example, that this phone has number memories, which was something innovative in those days? As a short reminder, the Nasisus 270 telephone has been produced in Poland most probably since 1988 in a company called Telecom Phone Factory in Radom. The former catalogue from 1993 shows that Nasisus was one of several dozen devices offered by that factory. I also managed to get an interesting album released in 1988 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the company. I am presenting two small photos coming from it. One concerning prototype research and second about the award that this phone won and of which its manufacturer was undoubtedly proud. However, let's move on the operation principles. A small part of the information may be repeated with the video about repairing this device. But to ensure completeness of this mini lecture, I decided to take such a step. Let's take a look at the schematic diagram. There are three wires as the input, those marked with the symbols LA and LB and with the colors green and red respectively are connected to the exchange, and more about them in a moment. The white wire may be a bit surprising for some. Well, it allows you to attach an additional second external bell to the telephone, for example placed in another room. But some people use this white line also for other purposes, inconsistent with the manufacturer's intention. Namely, the device was designed at the time when the availability of electronic components was not so common. Thanks to this line, they used the phone ringer as a bell, for example to the entrance gate to the property or for the apartment door, instead of buying an extra device. Obviously, this was the wrong approach and could cause the telephone exchange malfunctioning. By the way, let's do a little experiment. A laboratory power supply will be useful here. Let me show you what a great device I have. We can generate the sound by applying the voltage to the white and red wires. The latter is a common one for connecting to the exchange and for the additional ring triggering circuit. Please remember what tone the phone makes in this configuration. It sounds different comparing to the melody raised by the telephone exchange. But let's go back to the traditional role of this device, which means phone calls. Let's start in a bit unusual way. What is the role of the element marked with the VR symbol in the diagram? It is a varistor that is a component whose role is to protect against excessive transient voltages. Simplifying, it can be said that in a normal situation it plays the role of invisible eminence, to be precise, its resistance is very high. And when suddenly too high voltage appears in the circuit, it takes over the pulse energy. The resistance rapidly decreases. Voltage spikes can occur in any network, and the former overhead telephone lines were particularly vulnerable to them. 
In the times of smartphones, it's hard to imagine that many years ago a telephone connection was carried out using cables hung on poles by the road. Well, the role of the bell in this device is played by a piezoelectric buzzer. It makes use of an interesting physical phenomenon which, to put it simply, bases on the fact that some materials, and more precisely crystals, change their dimensions when an external electric field is applied. Such buzzers usually have a simple electronic circuit in one housing, which is a frequency generator, in this case probably 4 kHz, thanks to which they emit a sound when the voltage is applied. This phenomenon also works the other way around. The mechanical stress applied to such a material, in other words compression, cause an electric current to appear. This is used for example in piezoelectric gas igniters that do not require any power supply and can produce a small spark. This phenomenon is also used in more serious applications for example to generate ultrasound, which is used in sonography to look inside the human body. However, a buzzer alone is not enough. It is worth taking a look at the entire module that is responsible for the ringing sound. Here we have a PO hook switch. When the handset is on the hook, the switch is in the position as it is shown now. Then the talking circuit is disconnected and only the ring unit and the keypad circuit is in contact with the exchange. The design where the keypad module is connected to the telephone network all the time is quite unusual, but more on that later. When the telephone exchange delivers only direct current, the capacitor C1 is an impassable barrier. However, when the exchange adds an alternating component to the direct current, Figuratively speaking, this barrier disappears and then the ringing circuit is powered. Here we can see three resistors and two Zener diodes. They are responsible for matching the voltage from the telephone network to the voltage needed by the piezoelectric buzzer and also create a kind of protection system. Diodes D7 and D8 act as a voltage divider. Additionally, the D7 diode is a voltage limiter and the D8 acts additionally as a typical rectifier diode and cuts off half of the waveform. As a result, we have 25 Hz or possibly 50 Hz current from the telephone line but for which part of the waveform was cut off. Additionally, as already mentioned, the buzzer has its own 4 kHz generator. As a result of these two waveforms overlapping, we get a very characteristic sound. Let's listen to it for a moment. As you can hear, this is a different sound than the one when the laboratory power supply was connected to the phone. Why? First of all, because in the previous case the direct current was connected. When the red and white wires are used, capacitor C1 does not matter. Secondly, as you have noticed, the exchange does not deliver variable current all the time when the caller is waiting for connection, but it makes some breaks. At times when it transmits only direct current, the telephone does not ring. Therefore, even if we connected an alternating current to the red and white wires, the sound would also differ from the situation when we connect the device to the telephone exchange. Finally, it is worth mentioning the resistor R7 and the adjacent PW switch, which means the min-max switch visible on the housing. They allow you to select one of the two ring volumes. Adding this additional resistor to the circuit makes the sound quieter. Phew. 
we managed to discuss, I hope enough precisely, the ring unit. Ready to lock horns with the next part of the phone diagram? Don't worry, we'll cover some parts only briefly and soon we'll move on to this device functionality. So what else is on the diagram? The KWI 275 keypad unit is powered by a typical rectifier bridge consisting of four rectifying diodes, which ensures that the keyboard is powered only by a direct current and additionally by a resistor R1 responsible for voltage matching. Interestingly, the keypad module is powered from the exchange all the time, also when the handset is on the hook. In many other phone models, instead of such a solution, either an external power supply connected to the main sockets was used, or possibly several batteries, usually AA or AAA, to maintain the voltage. As I mentioned in my video about the repair of this device, unfortunately, I did not manage to get the KWI275 circuit diagram but I only found the datasheet of the UM91611 chip used in it with an exemplary application diagram. Thus, we will not discuss its operation in detail. Let me just say that this module is responsible for generating short pulses corresponding to the selected digits. Longer break between the series of pulses allowed the exchange to recognize that in a moment the telephone will transmit information about the next selected digit of the number. This method of numbers dialing is an older solution and we call it impulse dialing, as opposed to the currently popular tone dialing, where each key has a different sound. In simplifying terms, it can be said that pulse dialing corresponds to fast and with appropriate poses pressing on the telephone hook, or in other words, shorting the line. In my childhood days, we even did contests for who will be able to dial the number in this way. Usually, however, it was difficult to keep sufficiently short pulses and appropriate breaks, so either the exchange did not recognize the number at all, or it made a connection with a completely different one than expected. Hello, Mr. IT guy in action. It is nice that you are calling us. You are a very important customer for us. Let's forget for a moment about the circuit diagram and let's discuss the most important functions of this telephone within this break. We'll return to the operation principles later in the video as there are a few more elements left to be discussed. When looking on the phone, it is hard to guess that it provides quite extensive, as for those times, functionality. All because these additional features are hidden under the key combinations. So what can you do? Redial the number using the shortcut key. Hang up the call not by putting down the handset on the cradle, but by using two keys. You can also use the memory to store the selected numbers under each digit in two ways, either by simply entering it digit by digit or by saving the last number dialed. Of course, you can also get a connection to the number stored in the memory or to delete the selected one. Finally, there is also a slightly unusual feature that the manual describes as inhibit redialing. If someone wants to call a number so that after dialing it the phone will forget it, which means that it will not be possible to redial it, he should use this function for real spice. And not only. Moreover, it is possible, whether for a number stored in memory or when entering number by hand, to set a pose via the hash key, which is useful when someone wants to call an extension. 
Then, for example, you dial the number of the hospital's exchange, then you press the hash key one or more times and then enter the extension number. The phone dials the number slowly and laboriously and while waiting for the call you can drink, for example, a glass of orange juice. The memory of the numbers consists of 10 positions and each of them can have 18 digits. The capacity was prepared with a considerable margin because at the time the local numbers in Poland had 6 digits and intercity numbers had 9 digits, including the initial 0. In addition, the dialing buffer has 22 digits, which in particular means that in the case of a longer number you cannot use the redial function. Of course, nowadays such an electronic telephone directory does not surprise anyone. But in the past, after the period of rotary dial phones that did not provide similar functionality, it was a kind of novelty. Let's do a little experiment. I am saving a number in the phone's memory. Then I am disconnecting the device from the telephone network for a long while. After reconnecting, will the phone still remember the number? Let's check it out. The phone is still keeping the number in its memory. Isn't that a pleasant surprise? Time to look inside the phone again. So what happens when you pick up the handset? The PO switch changes its position and then the exchange detects the change in load. It still supplies the phone, but this time the talking circuit and it sends an additional free line signal to the handset, also as an appropriate variable component. It is also possible to select the phone number for what the previously mentioned KWI 275 module is responsible for. After dialing the number and establishing the connection, the voice is sent in both directions. The handset plays the most important role here. The diagram shows it in its simplest version, with a carbon microphone cartridge and a headphone cartridge. It should also be remembered that the carbon microphone gives rather strong signal. In my copy, a certain trick was made and the carbon microphone was replaced with a dynamic one. The latter provides better call quality but requires an additional amplifier based in this case on three transistors and a few additional elements which is not required in the case of the carbon microphone. Unfortunately, I do not have the schematic diagram of the amplifier used in the Narcissus phone but I found a twin circuit diagram from another model of the same manufacturer called Pansy without any problems. How is it that the voice reaches the interlocutor sometimes even on the other side of the world and vice versa? This is definitely the topic for a longer discussion. In a nutshell, direct current modulated by voice, this modulation is the result of the microphone, so finally the variable current, or simply saying a signal from microphone, is sent through many devices operating between both devices to the telephone of our interlocutor and more precisely to the handset. There is also a side tone preventive circuit based on a transformer, several resistors and a capacitor. What is its role? If telephone exchange used three wires to connect subscribers instead of two, the situation would be much simpler. However, every additional cord times the billions of telephone sockets in the world would cause enormous cost. Therefore, it was decided to use only two wires. So we have a situation where our voice reaches the interlocutor through the same lines as the interlocutor's voice reaches us. In simple terms, 
The idea is to eliminate the echo effect and mute the voice of the person using the handset, so that he cannot hear himself in the receiver at the same time. This attenuation is not perfect, but large enough. Interestingly, we have become so used to the fact that the effect of some audible feedback occurs in a minor form that its complete elimination, as research shows, causes many people to scream into the handset, feeling that the other person cannot hear them. On the other hand, the effect that is too loud will often result in very soft speaking into the microphone, making the voice on the other end of the line difficult to understand. This applies not only to landfine phones, but also to mobile phones. It is also worth adding that the presence of a transformer in the system is associated with the use of the mutual inductance phenomenon, and more precisely magnetic fields mutual counteracting generated by the first and second windings. It means one connected with the microphone and the second with the speaker. In this way, the interlocutor hearing himself herself effect is reduced. Not every side tone preventive circuit system includes a transformer. There are simple ones based only on resistors and more complicated ones. Most newer landline phones don't have a transformer anymore probably due to the high cost, but also because of the large dimensions. The C2 capacitor, on the other hand, is responsible for balancing the circuit capacity with the telephone line capacity. We have also two diodes D5 and D6 to protect against too high signal level in the handset, which means, figuratively speaking, against a very loud crack, bang and other types of unpleasant sounds that may happen and would adversely affect hearing, for example when picking up the handset, but also for other reasons. This is how, in a nutshell, the Narcissus 270 phone works, but also many other models produced in the old days. Have you expected that an ordinary telephone hides so many secrets? Stay healthy!